Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fully Endorsed, episode 39, where we are here to talk about The Spy Who Loved Me from 1977. This is the, hold on, doing the math in my head really quickly. This is the ninth James Bond film? Close. Yes. The, ten- the tenth, apparently, according to Wikipedia. Tenth. Oh, yes, because I forgot to count the one Lazenby. That's right. Yes. Okay, so. <laughs> we yes, did a tenth. whole entire episode dedicated to him. We did, we did, yes. But I was just thinking six in the Conner era and then yeah. three in on more, and I completely forgot Lazy and Bibi for a mm-hmm. second. But yes, yeah, so the tenth James Bond film, um, and Andres' first Roger Moore. Um, so uh, yeah, without without further ado, I guess we should get right into it. Andres, what are your very, very broad sort of uh, initial thoughts mm. about? this movie and your experience watching it. I noticed that, like, so upon watching uh, Goldfinger, I noticed that a lot of the standard tropes associated with both the Bond franchise and the spy genre as a whole, uh, I could see them all originating with that iconic film. And more, I've noticed, like, a lot more of that with The Spy Who Loved Me, um, a lot of the stuff that I've come to recognize through the pop culture zeitgeist uh, in terms of like large scale end of the world, you know, safe, safe, uh, large scale disasters and uh, like lots of action and explosions. I feel like a lot of that may have come from this movie or had let or came from a lot of the more era. It's at least I'm not sure about you, but like from what I've seen from The Spy Who Loved Me, I'm under the assumption that the Roger Moore era was a more like kind of like up the ante uh, in terms of action and spectacle. Uh, not to dis- not to discredit what I saw in Goldfinger at all whatsoever. That was also, you know, amazing, but it's like I feel like this movie here, in terms of its its action and spectacle, seemed to have topped wh- whatever uh, what was previously set. Man- yeah, managed to like raise the bar higher for the franchise and the genre as a whole. Yes, well, you haven't seen um, You Only Live Twice. That's I-, I think that's the first movie that really does that. Um, that's mm. that's Connery's fifth film. Um, his films sort of progressively got the stakes got you know more and more. Um, you know, the Thunderball was like a huge step up in that department, and then you get to You Only Live Twice, and You Only Live Twice is the one that introduces like I mean that's the first movie where we actually meet Blofeld face to face. It introduces like the big elaborate secret villain layer and the the crazy plan that one involves like stealing uh spaceships and and uh trying to start a war between america and russia and and like uh, all the all the all those sorts of like crazy things that uh, you know all the parodies love to uh, parody uh-huh. um and then after that they sort of what's interesting is there are two types of Bond movies. There are the big bombastic ones where the villain is trying to destroy the world. And then there are the sort of smaller scale, just sort of espionage stories. Hmm. And what tends to happen is that Bond, each movie will get progressively bigger and bigger until they like crescendo. And then they'll go back to small again. Um, you see this a, a couple times in more. Um, after this movie, we have Moonraker, which basically does this again, but uh, in spite. Spice! <laughs> And then after that, we get For Your Eyes Only, which is another movie that um, we may cover on this show one day, because that's, that's a very good one, um, which is more of a sort of down-to-earth spy story about, uh, you know, um, so, this so in, in British, other word, uh, <laughs> go ahead. decoder that uh, it's about a British decoder that the Russians are trying to get their hands on, and James Bond is trying to get it back from this, like, guy who's trying to sell it to the Russians, and it's, it's, a, it's a much more sort of small-scale affair. So in other words, we get more and more... We do get more and more, uh, but I would say that you're not wrong in that it that formula becomes more ubiquitous. I think within the Moore era, mm-hmm. um, because I think the only Connery film that really feels like that, or like feels like it's on that same scale in terms of the stakes and stuff, um, is You Only Live Twice. I mean, you can make an argument for. Uh, Diamonds Are Forever also because the villain plot in that movie is pretty large scale but that movie is odd in so many ways uh, mm-hmm. um, it, doesn't, it doesn't do it well I'll say it that way <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, there are some that would argue yeah, and very good arguments I might add 
that uh, for your first more movie, I really should have shown you um, his first movie, uh, uh, Live and Let Die. Um, however, much like Goldfinger for Connery, I felt like The Spy Who Loved Me um, is a much, aside from being my personal favorite Roger Moore movie, mm -hmm. uh, it's also a better showcase of what the Moore era as a whole is. Hmm. Because oh. Live and Let Die and the second film, The Man with the Golden Gun, those are still, you know, more kind of finding his footing, figuring out what his bond is going to be like. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the writers are still figuring out how best to write for him. Mm -hmm. And this happens a lot of times with, with James Bond actors. By the time you get to the third movie, that's when they really sort of solidify their portrayal. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. certain actors such as Lazenby and uh, Timothy Dalton never quite uh, <laughs> got there. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, yeah, all the others, it's usually like third movie is the charm. I mean, it's the Skyfall for Daniel Craig, uh, Goldfinger for Connery, and then uh, this for Roger Moore. Nice, nice. Okay, then. And uh, th that's another thing. In, in terms of, like, watching this portrayal of Bond, I got the sense, that, and this was something that I brought up to you as we were watching the film, um, I got the sense that this was a more quippier Bond, if, if that's even a real word, I doubt it is. Or rather, this was like, like, there were, like, I would say Sean Connery certainly had his moment, his uh, moment where he would have, like, a witty line or a witty retort. But I feel like yeah. during his bits of dialogue, he would always have someone to work off of. Whereas in this one, these came off more as, like, one-liners, yeah, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Connery had them, but they weren't as prevalent. Uh, you know, the, the one that I always think about, I think it was at the beginning of Goldfinger, mm -hmm. where he kills that guy and, and by electrocuting him, and then he goes, shocking, absolutely shocking, and then he leaves. <laughs> True. Um, he, he would have moments like that. Roar, uh, more, rather, I, <laughs> I combined Roger and Moore into Roar. Uh, more on the, the other The ultimate hand. bond. <laughs> Yes. Uh, more, on the other hand, does it more. He, um, ah. he, he, more of everything during this era. He, uh, he quips far more often. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, good quips, too. I, I think he's quite funny. In oh, this. Uh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was yes, it? You're absolutely right. <laughs> the, 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 Go ahead. This, this is sort of more in line with sort of the, the type of spy portrayal that, like, Austin Powers would be going off of later you know the sort of spy craft but with like a wink and a smile and a joke you know yes yes <laughs> very true there um I i'm trying right now uh, like me it's just because i've only watched the movie right now but i'm trying to see if i can look up for some lines that i really enjoyed back in those days um uh, what was it uh I think there was, yeah, there was one point where there was like a motorcycle henchman flies off a cliff and he's like, oh, those flat feathers and he still can't fly. Yeah, he's full of them. He's full. Of, I mean, the, the most the, the most famous one for me, the one that I always sticks in my mind, of course, is the very last line of the film when uh, there's him and Agent Triple X are caught uh, yes. fooling around in the skate pod by their superiors. Ooh -wee. Spoilers, by the way. Uh, yes. If you're, <laughs> if you're new here, we spoil things. Um, spoiler, James Bond Fox. <laughs> yes, yes. Spoiler alert from a James Bond movie from 1977. But uh, yeah, he, they do the do, uh, and they, they're caught by their superiors. And um, the Minister of Defense says, uh, goes, uh, you know, good God, man, what are you doing? <laughs> and Bond looks at him and says, keeping the British end up, sir. And then... Uh, <laughs> cut to credits it's, it's so good it's yes so good. yes I'm, I'm surprised I, like I you don't I don't expect to hear double entendres <laughs> uh, there's an even better one at the end of Moonraker and yeah. I'll just tell it to you now because we're okay. probably never going to cover that one okay but um and this one is great because Q actually gets to say it ah it's uh Bond is coming back into orbit with the female from that movie and the, he his superiors it's practically the same scene Moonraker in a lot of ways is like a carbon copy of this movie but with space and they see him on a screen you know uh, getting down with the lady of the film and they're like what's 007 doing and Q goes I think he's attempting re-entry sir <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, I, I do wonder, were these movies rated R back in their day? I don't know. That's a good question. 
Yeah, because yeah, like the, the rating system was different back then. Yeah, too. yeah, I know. Like uh, st- a lot stuff, of movies uh-huh. back in the day that were rated PG would definitely be rated PG thirteen now. You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. <laughs> it's talking dog. You don't know. Like it's it's a very different um, situation. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I wonder what oh, was so. Spy. Yeah, so apparently it's rated PG according to IMDb. Right. Yeah. Again, you could get a lot away well, with a lot in PG back in the day because PG was just sort of it's not a kids movie, but it's not dirty enough to be an R. You know what I mean? Whereas right, right. Um, nowadays PG is just a step above G. <laughs> like right. it's, and it's nothing. It's, it's kind of funny to think of James Bond as a PG movie only because it's like. I don't know, how, what were the Daniel Craig and, and Pierce Brosnan movies rated back when they came out? Good question. Let's see, I'm going to check Skyfall right now. Skyfall was rated... Wait, that's not right. It can't have been rated G. What the hell, Google? Let's see here. Oh, wow, I just realized Skyfall apparently came, is almost 10 years old. Yeah, it came out in 2012. Wow. Wow. That's why Daniel Craig, in terms of years, is the longest running Bond, because they take so much time in between movies. Mm. Back in the day, we would get a James Bond movie every, like, two or three years. Now we're right. lucky to get two in the same decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, okay. it's a very different landscape. So it looks like uh, Skyfall was rated PG-13. Yeah, okay, yeah. That makes and sense. As, yeah, and as for, let's say, uh, Goldeneye... Let's see, Golden Eye. What was that rated? That was. Because you're allowed to have mild, mm-hmm. like, sex scenes in like a PG-13 movie, as long as, as long as nobody says the fuck word. Uh, yes, or do, or does the fuck word? Right. Uh, but that's, that's th- an entirely it... different rating. <laughs> uh, let's see. So it uh, looks like Golden Eye was also PG-13. So I guess like Bond in general has been a rather PG-13 franchise. And I kind of funny. I, I find it funny that for a franchise that features so much violence, on-screen death, and yes. so much nobody sex- cares about those things though. But the fact that there's so if this is a uh, a character known for his sexual promiscuity that they're able to get away with this much. Especially in the 70s, no doubt, when where you have literal topless women dancing and floating around in the intro sequence. Yeah, but again, the 70s. Uh, you remember uh, when we watched Enter the Dragon? True, uh, yes. <laughs> and some of the things you saw in Enter the Dragon, Andres? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's just that I, I always thought that the... Uh, the seventies or like earlier films would often be more strict as opposed to being more uh more lenient when it in terms of rating. Like this was the era where like Midnight Cowboy was considered an X rated movie, whereas if you look at it now today, it's like it's barely an R film, I think. Right. And if this came out in the fifties, I would agree with you. Like uh-huh. if this was if this was Leave It to Beaver Times. But the seventies are a little bit freer about that sort of thing, you know. Okay. Um, and then it would get it would crack down again in the 80s when when conservatism went back on the rise and that's when you know i believe that's when the pg-13 rating got created and the the 80s was like a huge, it's it's a it goes back and forth you know mm, uh true, you know, true. you always assume that the older a film is the more chaste it must be but that's not necessarily always the case it kind of like because you know you have pre-code would basically anything win and then you have code and then you have like the loosening of the code and then eventually you have you know the mpaa and it's like it's a whole thing it's a very complex uh topic that we could mm-hmm. be here talking about for hours but we're not here to talk about that one, right right we're here to talk about <laughs> bond <laughs> bond yes we're talk about the second biggest movie of 1977 i think everybody can knows what the first is um if you, if you don't uh it, it was a little movie that took place in the galaxy far far away yes but you know what was big two years before this movie came out what was uh, big? the biggest the biggest film of 1975 was a little something called jaws ah uh, and there's a lot of that in this movie isn't there there's True, a lot yeah of this, a lot of there's water a lot of the sea yes a lot of sharks a lot of there's even a character named jaws yes um, <laughs> now uh, is I always thought because you know what was it? Thunderball was one of the earliest movies, one of the only, one of the very few Bond movies I ever saw on TV, and I always associated that as the one with a lot of water. But I guess is the Spy Who Loved Me the one associated with water the most? A lot of James Bond movies have a lot of water. Uh, uh. For Your Eyes Only um, also has um, quite a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
Mm. And, uh, so, so sometimes there's a lot of boat stuff. Sometimes there isn't. You know, it's like I was telling you about uh, skiing. There's a lot of skiing yes. in James Bond movies. It happened in, um, I believe, on Her Majesty's Secret Service was the first Bond movie that had like a lot of like notable skiing, and then it, it happens again here very early on in that amazing uh, chase sequence. Uh, yes. Of Your Eyes Only features skiing. Uh, there's another one. I think of you to a kill, maybe. There's like another ski chase scene at the beginning of another one of the of Moore's films, but it's one of the later ones that's very reminiscent of the one from this one. Not nearly as good. And then um, there was skiing in uh, the Brosnan era in um, that one movie. The world is not enough. Uh, and I and there was a similar location in um, in Spectre, although I don't think Bond actually skied in that one. So yeah, there's a lot of skiing stuff in Bond yes. too. There, there, there are sort of things that this franchise revisits from time to time, just because you know, there's 25 of these fucking things, and there's so many locations to visit. Right. Spe so. Speaking of locations, we got ourselves a quite an interesting like set of lo locales for this film. Um, one of them was definitely was uh, I found to be the most fascinating was Egypt, where you had uh, location, you had uh, sequences that took place according to Wikipedia in both Cairo and Luxor. Um, right. You also had a few Italian locales. Apparently, some underwater scenes were filmed in the Bahamas. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like much like the first movie, where it was like a cross country. Uh, what do you call it? Not cross country, but like a, uh, the the character of Bond would travel from one exotic locale to the other. Here we get more of that, and the both the the cinematography as well as just like the the natural beauty of these on uh on location shots are <clears throat> quite immaculate i would say and help to yeah. sort of provide more of a of a vi visual feast to the eyes um beyond the the crazy special effects and action sequences that we would later get in the plot Right, and that's um that's another sort of staple of this franchise. One of the things that people love about it is sort of the travel log aspects. You know, you go to these movies and you see these exotic places that you you'll probably never get to go to yourself, and it's it's just part of the fantasy. And it's like you, you get to imagine like being in these in these fantastical locations. Right. Um, in a way, it's kind of like um sort of like how James Bond romanticizes the idea of espionage. I guess you could say the same thing for in how Indiana Jones romanticized the idea of like archaeology and traveling to um, hidden temples from lost civilizations and finding um, these wonderfully preser preserved artifacts from a bygone era. And then putting them in a museum. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and then, like on top of that, it's just like I mentioned from the beginning. The biggest takeaway for me was just how crazy the uh, special effects had had and, and spectacle had amped up. Because like we got ourselves a lot of crazy concepts. Um, we got oh okay. So this the one that took me by surprise, where it's like it was the car that transforms into a like a uh, into a pseudo submarine, and this is yes, something yes. I've seen this many is one times. Of my, yeah, this go is ahead. One of my favorite Bond cars in the entire franchise. Obviously, the uh, Aston Martin DB5 from Goldfinger is like the iconic, famous spy car. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is one of my favorites because of the whole submarine thing. It's really it's a fantastic sequence. And I can tell that they really liked they really wanted to choose that car model in spe in particular because it probably at the time looked the most futuristic with its very like geometric uh shape uh, uh, of the design yeah. akin to like the DeLorean. It's very sleek. It's a very yeah. sleek car. It almost looks like a space capsule or something. I want to say it's a Lotus, uh I think. I think that's what I believe that's what you found out when we saw the movie itself. Yeah. And uh, uh and it is a, uh, it's a beautiful car. It looks really cool. Yes, yes, and it led to a really great underwater sequence. Very ambitious for its time, and I can only want imagine just how a much of a technical challenge it was to achieve those type of effects. Um, yes. On top yeah, of that, I mean, we you're combining uh -huh. underwater photography with um, uh, blue screen work, blue screen work, and and a bunch of other things. I really don't know how they did, how they did it. To be honest. And then there's the scene where he drives out of the ocean. Yes. The <laughs> <laughs> he like rolls down his window and throws out a fish. It's kind of a dumb joke, but it's really funny. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just a great sequence. 
Oh, absolutely, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a... I, I, wait, didn't they also do that in the Blues Brothers movie at one point? Or maybe I'm thinking Blues I, Brothers 2000. I don't remember, but maybe. Okay. Uh, we also had the... What was it? The... Uh, the uh, what, what was the vi- super villain team called? The the Legion of Doom super uh, uh, villain yeah. super yeah, villain yeah, base. The, so so Stromberg, the villain of this film, yes. his uh, base, which he calls Atlantis, is this sort of underwater base that can rise up out of the ocean, and it looks a lot like the Legion of Doom. Yes. <laughs> so uh, as it rose from the depths, I was like, meanwhile at the Legion of Doom. Uh, and that, that sort of just became what we called it. Uh, so yes, we have the Legion of Doom, which is a fantastic sort of model. It looks really cool. Yes. Um, looks like a giant black four-legged spider dome. Basically. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about like the rooms that we see them in on the inside and like how they fit all that within that shape, but whatever. Right, but like, uh, don't think about it. <laughs> just, don't, just don't think about it. Just don't, don't even. Uh, <laughs> but it's really cool. It's really cool. What did you think about um, Stromberg, the villain of this movie? He's sort of... Um, He's sort of Blofeld-esque. He's one of those types of Bond villains, and uh, you know we, we we haven't really done that yet on this show. Uh-huh. So, uh, what do you think about that that whole that sort of mold, the sort of the mold that Doctor Evil would later parody? Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, I found him to be a very a very cool villain. I thought like from his introduction right away, where he just like kills off three of his henchmen without like a second thought. I thought it was like. I thought to myself, this guy's like a stone cold, like a, a stone cold blooded killer who is willing to stop at nothing to achieve his his goals. And I thought that made him really cool. I mean, the fact that he like he, he had like he, at, they they pull like a what do you call it a subverted expectations twice, where it's like, oh, you two scientists, uh, before you go, I have to mention someone who has been spilling secrets, someone who is within one who is within this base. And then turns out it's the woman, and he just drops the woman into a shark tank. Uh, yeah, that was great. By the way, which now I know where that reference to from Team America World Police came from. Uh, right. And then it's like, okay, so now they're gone. And then he proceeds to blow up their fucking helicopter. Yeah, he's great. He's ruthless, and he's great. Yeah. Um, I love his, like, the layer, like, the way it looks. Mm-hmm. And, like, he plays, like, classical music while he's sort of just watching his fish and eating at this big, elaborate table. I I love the way Bond villains live. They have the most mm-hmm. fat, like, fabulous lives. Yes. My whole yeah. life, Andre. All I've ever wanted to do is <laughs> Have is a super villain like layer. <laughs> yes, yes. Th- these are my ambitions. I want to live like a Bond villain and dress like a Batman villain. That's all I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, it, it's just a great, it's just great. And it, it, it tells you so much about his personality without having to spend, like, a ton of time, like, uh, on exposition, you know? Right, right. Um, I'll tell you something interesting about his character that I'm almost guarantee you that you didn't pick up on because nobody ever does. Okay. So oftentimes Bond villains will have some sort of a disfigurement. Oh. Um, Stromberg is supposed to have webbed hands, and it's you can. It, they didn't do a very good job of, of making it clear in the movie. Nobody ever notices no. it. No, I didn't. <laughs> You have to look very carefully to even notice. Uh, there's like a, they even have like a whole joke about it because when Bond goes to meet him in that one scene when he's undercover as a marine biologist, mm-hmm. Stromberg's sort of hench lady tells him, uh, Mr. "Mr. Stromberg doesn't like to shake hands." And so, of course, the first thing Bond does when he gets up there is fucking offer him his hand, uh, uh, which Stromberg declines. But yes, he's he's supposed to have like webbed hand, which is like a real congenital thing. You know, everybody has like small webs between their fingers, but some people yeah. are born with like excess skin there. Um, huh? Yeah. So anyway, yes, that's, I'm, that's I'm, supposed I'm, to be a thing. Yeah, I'm looking at an image right here where it's like he's putting he's clasping his hands together in the the classic uh, supervillain pose, but it's like I can barely see that webbing, and only in like one shot where I can see like some excess webbing between his uh, index finger and his thumb. But it's like, I right. guess that shot must have happened too quickly because that could uh, that could potentially be just like, you know, regular the regular level of webbing that any human hand has. If you don't right, pay yeah, attention yeah. to it. I don't know if it's just because they didn't film it in a way where it made it stand out or if it's because um, the makeup itself, the, the like makeup effect itself wasn't like uh, clear enough. It didn't stand out enough. But it it just doesn't come across the first time you see the film. I, it was years before I found out that he was supposed to have webbed yeah. hands. <laughs> it was weird. Uh, it was years before I found out he was the penguin. 
Right, exactly. Tim Burton's Penguin, specifically. Yeah, look, look at this screenshot right here. It's like, even looking at it dead on, it still doesn't look enough like webbing to me. Right, exactly, exactly. You have to look for it's like once you notice it it's like oh but it's like it's so it's too subtle i think is the problem and they don't draw enough attention to it in the plot and there's no moment where somebody says uh oh, you know carl stromberg he has webbed hands <laughs> you know so yeah. it's like so it's like you don't even notice it as opposed to jaws whose physical uh differences are very obvious what yes do you think about jaws? <laughs> jaws, jaws was is probably yeah jaws is probably the most famous henchman in the entire james bond franchise i don't think i'm going out on a limb saying that uh, no no jaws is fucking amazing man he is like he took what was i feel like he took i'm you know again i don't have the full context of the bond series just going off of just this one in golden eye but i feel like he took what made odd job awesome and like more uh took it to the next level and it's like yes. this is like a, a straight up super he's a straight up super villain superhuman villain uh i'd expect him to go toe to toe with spider-man at this point <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a trope in um, in James Bond movies. There's there's a character who I I like to refer to as the heavy, who's sort mm. of just like the main hinge person, and they're usually like huge and bulking and like super strong, and they they're there to present a, a physical threat mm. to Bond. The first example of this was actually in the uh, from Russia with Love. There was a character called Red Grant who was played by um, I'm blanking on the actor's name, but he went on to be Quint in Jaws. Okay, um, and he uh he he was sort of there to be bond sort of physical match and they have this sort of fight on a train and it's 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 very good um and then the second one is odd job in goldfinger who sort of upped the ante a little bit with his like crazy like hat throwing gimmick and he sort of has a little bit more of that like superhuman type level of strength that became more associated with this type of character mm -hmm. jaws i would argue is the pinnacle of this character type just the pinnacle um he's fantastic he's super threatening he's like nine fucking feet tall yes <laughs> he's got uh, the actor's name it's like richard keel keel or something like that he played um the alien in that episode of uh the twilight zone where it was a cookbook you remember oh yeah uh, yeah so like he's if anybody's seen that you know he's like this huge man he's like yeah. super tall and then they give him these like he, he's also like a very he has a very distinguished like a very particular face about him a, a face that was made for the movies you know he doesn't need any prosthetics other than his teeth right he's, a, he's got a great character actor's face you know he looks like a bad guy and then he's <laughs> those teeth oh the teeth are fantastic Apparently he couldn't wear them for very long on set because they didn't fit right in his uh. mouth, so they were they were quite uh, uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's an amazing effect. It looks great. Super, and, yeah. I just, and his method of murder uh -huh. is so gruesome. Right, right. He, he gets, just like, he just like vampires you, but in like the most brutal way possible. I'm assuming. Like you see him like biting people on the neck, and I'm assuming that he like must uh, must like be crushing or severing an artery to let them like bleed to death. There's not a whole lot of blood, so a lot of it is like implied or like kind of like framed off camera. Um, right. But still, like when you see his his bite, you know he's kill he kills people in the movie, so you it's already established this guy can like snuff you out real quickly. So like anytime he's like up like like getting his 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 grubby mitts on on Bond or or Agent Triple X, you you kind of feel a little like uh uh. What's what's a phrase? What's that phrase where it's like you feel really uncomfortable as, uh, as like as you feel for the characters as they are, as he he closes in on on his prey, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at one point he bites a shark. Yes, he bit the. Fu he had <laughs> yeah, Jaws versus Jaws in this movie, and and he came out on top. And I'm pretty sure all the sharks in this movie are real. They look real anyway. They're this, uh, it's uh, it's good sharks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that that was pretty surprising to see that there. It's like, oh wow, that's that's a real shark moving right there with that man. Yep. Uh, so yeah, he's 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 fantastic. He he's in Moonraker also, but he gets nerfed in that movie a little bit. They uh -huh. they play him up more for laughs. There are a few funny moments with him in this movie, mm -hmm. but not to the same extent of what goes on in Moon, Moonraker. Mm -hmm. Um. But he was a fan favorite, so they brought him back. Yeah, <laughs> even as a cart, even even as a, they brought him back in the cartoon James Bond Junior, where they gave him like a set of teeth that looked like a bear trap. 
Yeah, I thought we agreed not to talk about James Bond here anymore. I thought. <laughs> but isn't it, ca- is it canon though, Dylan? I saw a, uh, good question. I saw a, uh, a, an article recently that was like, Tom Holland would love to play James Bond. And I was like, James Bond Jr. Uh, reboot anybody? <laughs> Oh boy! As long as they bring back uh, the odd job dressed up as fucking MC Hammer or or Flava Flav, I'm pretty sure that actor must be dead. Maybe. <laughs> and the guy who played the like uh, the the guy who played the parody of Odd Job in the Austin Powers movies, mm-hmm. Random Task, I think was the character's name. <laughs> um, that actor, he was like a Korean American. Like he like murdered somebody and went to prison. Oh fuck! The, wait, the Austin Powers actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> Not the odd job actor. By all by all accounts, he was a lovely man. But no, the yeah. the random task guy, he, he who threw a shoe. Who throws a shoe? Honestly, he. <laughs> I remember apparently, that now. He apparently like killed somebody and like went to prison or something like crazy. Did he kill them or, with a shoe? Or did something else? It was either he killed somebody or he. What did he do? Anyway, point is, he's he, he's, he's a gone. bad man. <laughs> he's a bad man. How did I get onto that subject? Uh, James Bond Jr. But no. Uh, oh yeah, that that derailed everything. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so going back to to Jaws, I did want to mention how, like, I love how ridiculously pow- like powerful he is. Where it's like nothing can stop him. He gets buried alive in a bunch of like uh, con- stones and, and construction material. He just walks off like it's nothing. He gets slammed into a wall by a car. He just eats that shit <laughs> into a, tears it apart. Yep. He yep. gets like fucking thrown out of a train. He just again walks it off like it's nothing. Shrugs it off like it's nothing. <laughs> Dropped into a shark tank. And eats he the shark. Fucking eats the shark. <laughs> And then by the end of the movie, he just swims away. <laughs> the Legion of Doom sinks into the ocean, and he just swims back to shore. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's, he's Godzilla at that point, swing away away from camera at the end of the movie. It's like in fucking Superman the Animated Series, when, when uh, at the end of the first episode with Metallo, they throw him into the ocean, and he sinks to the bottom because he's made of uh, metal. And then at the end of the episode, you just see his silhouette walking across the ocean floor yes. back towards the land that's fucking jaws in this movie yes <laughs> fucking nothing can stop him and I, I love the trope where it's like his boss is already dead but he doesn't care he's this this time it's personal uh to right. quote jaws the revenge there where he's he's still at at uh, he still like wants to see uh J- J- bond bond's head on a silver platter yep pretty much that's pretty much all he wants and, uh, also, I, I do got to give a shout out to, uh, I give a mention to, I believe her name was Naomi. I think it was Naomi who was Stromberg's assistant, uh, the one who never wears a shirt, always walking around right. in a bikini, which no problem there for me. A uh, bikini and one of those like weird beach jacket things, you know what I'm talking about? Where it's yeah, like... yeah, like a not a sundress. It's, I'm sure uh, if anyone who's into fashion is I'm probably going to sh- shout out the a... answer at me. I'm sure there's a word for it. It's like the length of a trench coat, and it, it, um, it's like it's like just like a jacket that you wear over a bikini, like when you're going to the beach, and it's made right. out of like a really thin, sort of almost see-through material, and it's got sort of a floral pattern on it. I'm sure there's a word for it. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, We're not clothes people. I'm not a clothes person, especially not <laughs> women's clothes. I know a lot about like you know, like suits and shit, like waistcoats and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know anything about like beach wear. I'm in a landlocked state. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Trust me. I've seen this I've guy. Never sw- even I, I've, seen, a beach. <laughs> I've seen this guy swim in a pool with his shirt on. I do that because uh, I don't know. Nobody wants to see all that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, Naomi, I, th- I think she, for the, the short period of time, she's in the movie. I thought she, um, played a good part, played her part decently. And, yeah, uh, and while we're on the subject of the yes. women folk, yes. uh, what did you think about the Bond girl for this movie? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Major, I think the character's name is Anya Amasova or something like that, otherwise known as Agent Triple X. She's yes. a Russian uh, agent who is uh, put on this mission. The, the Russians and the British are working together to try and stop whatever's going on. And so they uh, there's a joint mission between the KGB and MI6. And uh, she gets put on this mission with James Bond. And then there's a very interesting discovery later on in the film where she realizes that James Bond is actually responsible for killing 
her love interest, uh, who we met briefly at the beginning of the movie. He has a really cool death also. Um, he's the one that James Bond shoots with that, like, ski gun. Yes. Uh, but, um, so anyway, yes, yeah, so it's a very interesting sort of dynamic there. What did you think about her, uh, yeah. her character? Yeah, uh, she, she was really good. I'd say she... Well, she played a very different kind of part, antagonistic role compared to the the Bond girl from uh, from Goldfinger. Whereas in Goldfinger, right. you had a um, a villain's assistant who eventually turned a uh, villain's henchman who turns to the side of good. Whereas here, you have a very shaky partnership between the two rival faction uh, spy factions that being like mi6 and the kgb i really li like the sort of double layer of drama there you got like the political aspect because you know this is the middle of the cold war and the U both um the, uh the the uk the uk and russia i keep wanting to say the us because the us is always like the center of the world for everything but it's like not in this case uk and the ussr <laughs> yes uk um, and ussr so it's like there's definitely a lot of heated tension between the two factions during this time and i feel like it's replicated here very well and absolutely. So, we also meet yeah. um in this movie her boss uh general gogol Mm -hmm. who is uh, sort of who becomes a recurring character throughout the rest of the Moore era um, ah. and I think he and I think he even appears in the first Timothy Dalton movie if I'm not mistaken and so um uh, Bond fans are very familiar with that character that's that's a big deal like introducing him into the franchise at this point oh very cool um and like the whole personal angle as well I thought was a really neat way to show that a lot of Bond's actions in the movie would have consequences later on and I really liked him coming to. Uh, I, I really liked how he helped um, Anya come to terms with with the life of a spy. He says, you know, hey, yes, I did most likely kill the man, but this is our job. We are enemies. This is a thing that happens. And whenever any of us goes into a mission, we expect that any one of these missions could very well be our last one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, what I really I, I will say, like. She he, no, he go did, ahead. Uh, okay, I would say like it's a nice bit of it's a nice way to examine Bond's character to where it's like he does he does not feel remorseful. He doesn't re has he he shows remorse, but he doesn't show regret in killing him, uh, her her lover. Absolutely, yes. I'll tell you what I really appreciate about her. You know, a lot of people these days who write think pieces about the James Bond franchise and why it's outdated. And maybe we should just end it. Talk about, you know, the, the Bond girls and how they're sort of like, you know, damsels in distress. And they're, they're sort of weakly written. And Bond is just this swaggering sort of show. Chad. <laughs> Chad, who just comes in with his machismo and then they like fall over and suck his dick. And it's like, that happens sometimes, yes. But... The best Bond girls in the franchise are always the ones who you feel like are on an equal footing with James Bond. The, mm -hmm. They're the ones who feel like his contemporaries, like people who can hold their own with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pussy Galore had a little bit of that until um, she tried to wrestle him. And then um, and then uh, we, we, we found out who was on top in that situation real quick. Ooh-wee! <laughs> Ooh <-wee>. But Triple <laughs> trip X... Um, throughout the entire movie, very much feels like Bond's equal. Uh, yeah, she gets kid she gets captured near the end of the movie, and he does and like gets this. and gets forced into a skimpy dress by the villain. She gets sure, she sure. gets she gets slave layered. <laughs> she gets she gets slave layered a little bit, but you know, um, she's still very com uh, competent, and she's she's um, she's a great agent, and she feels like again like his opposite number within the kgb uh, the entire time that they're in egypt during the first half of the movie there's like all this clever banter and like back and forth and her and him like trying to one up each other because they're both at that point they're not working together at that right. point they're both after the microfilm yes which by the way i guess for those who don't know microfilm um was sort of like the plot device that was like the equivalent of of I'd say a USB stick today where it's like this one little item can hold the secrets to destroying or saving the world. Yes, microfilm is literally like film that's that's very very small that you, they would use to store like documents and stuff. Uh, the, if anybody here has a public library that still has like microfilm 
like of old like newspapers uh, and has ever had to look at one of those for like research purposes. It's a fucking pain in the ass. Um, and these days you have the internet, so who cares? But uh, <laughs> uh, if you ever want to know, uh, go if you're or any, for any fans of like Batman eighty nine, go back to the point. Uh, check out the 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 one scene where Vicky Vale checks out a bunch of old newspapers until she finds uh, Bru- the murder of Bruce Wayne's parents. That's I believe that's micro microfilm. Yeah, I think it is also. So yeah, they're after this microfilm, and there's all these great moments throughout the Egypt stuff where they're like one upping each other, and you know he's got it, and then she's got it, and like all this back and forth, and then finally she winds up knocking him out when mm-hmm. they're on the boat, and she takes the microfilm, um, only to then for him to come in and say, "Well, yes, you got it, but uh, it's missing several of the important uh, technical schematics." And so it's like they never stop one upping one upping each other, and it's yes. great. I, I love the the back and forth between them. Mm, absolutely yeah <laughs> and uh let's see when it comes to like that aspect i think that ultimately their complicated their romance leads their complicated romance leads to some of the more uh seems leads to a very interesting uh plot development to where once she is, turns out to be captured by blofeld at that point i feel like stromberg not sorry blofeld. It's, it's not, damn it it's stromberg yeah i don't know why he why, is very I, yeah, he is very Blofeld esque, so and I, I haven't even him. watched Blofeld technically. <laughs> yeah, you've never even seen a Blofeld. Yeah. I mean, you've seen Doctor Evil, who is a <laughs> who is a very clear Blofeld parody, but uh, you've never actually watched a Blofeld. Movie. Yes, we got to fix that one of these days. But uh, Stromberg, yeah, when she is eventually kidnapped by Stromberg, you have Bond who goes out of his way to uh, rescue her, even after everything's, you know, all said and done. And it's like, all they got to do is just blow up his his Atlantis base and be done with it. But it's like the fact that he 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 fights to get that extra like uh, 40 to 60 minutes to save her goes to show how just how much he has come to to love and respect her uh, as a as an ally, as a lover, as a fellow spy obviously she had to you know she had that that requires like a a large part on a lot uh i guess say a lot of accomplishment on her part to get bond to that point where he is willing to uh re- willing to risk everything to save her by the end of yes, the film even though she straight up told him when this mission is over i'm going to kill you yes exactly uh, which again great look at it uh, in, look into his character yes <laughs> um <laughs> And, and you know what? For 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 Bond, it's 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 uh, it's it's why he's one of the most badass characters in cinema. Bond don't give a damn about the consequences or the risk. If he wants something, he'll he'll make sure he'll he'll get the job done, whether it's for for his own personal needs or for for his country. Yes, well, women want him, and men uh, want him. I mean, want to be him, <laughs> uh, and he. It could be both. And he... Yeah, or both. Uh, yeah. Yes. Not that there's anything uh, wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. No, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. That, that, that is a great sort of character moment that he goes back and, and does that. Um, and then we have sort of the final confrontation between him and Stromberg in which he brutally murdered. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just like the sort of like um, how Bond just pulls like the reverse, essentially pulls the reverse Uno card on, on Stromberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think maybe shot him in the dick. I'm not sure exactly where that where it hit, but uh... right, right, because like, isn't that large tube attached to a gun? Where does that bullet go? <laughs> yeah, well, well, it was it was a bolt gun, and like a bolt gun. So he shot his bolt. James Bond got out of the way, and then he, so I guess his bullet must have gone down the tube through the bolt gun. And then hit Stromberg somewhere in his lower regions, right? And then he just shot him a, a bunch more times. Yes. It's, very, it's pretty. It's pretty unceremonious. A lot of times the villain deaths will be more um, outlandish than that. I mean, you remember Goldfinger when he got sucked out of the plane? Yes. <laughs> uh, in Live and Let Die, the main villain of that movie gets exploded. Yeah. Uh, like it's. Um, Maybe it's supposed to be, you know, it would know, be great if like Stromberg was like still struggling, was still alive, struggling to escape his sinking base, only for him to fall with at with the rest of Atlantis. Yeah, maybe. 
but I mean, I, I don't think I think he's supposed to be yeah. completely dead. Or, or so like maybe the idea is that for someone who has such a grand plan to you know destroy the world and recreate it in his image, it would turn out that for some someone who who plans such grand ideas to die the most pathetic and uh, unceremonious death. I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to work in an ironic way. Yeah, and that's kind of why I'm of two minds about it. On the one hand, it's like, well, this feels kind of anticlimactic. But on the other hand, I like how just, like, real it feels. Yeah. It just feels very, like... In like, the moment. In the moment, very unceremonious. It feels like how it would actually go down, you know? Yeah, and um, I suppose, like, the the reason why that was played down was because, I guess, the final duel with Jaws is meant to be the real climax, I guess. Yes, and that was good. That was good that we yes, got a was. final confrontation between Bond and Jaws that was quite good. Yeah, and, and speaking of, of you know, like ex, uh, explosive finales, the the whole uh, sequence inside, so in the movie, uh, Stromberg's got this, like, uh, gigantic tanker ship, which yes. swallows up submarines so that he can then, like, take control of those commands of those, like, Russian and, and um, British US submarines and use them to these are nuclear submarines and use them to like kickstart the nuclear apocalypse, World War Three, and all right. that shit. He paid some scientists to create a, a tracking system that would allow him to track nuclear submarines. Yes. Um, he then captures a couple of these nuclear submarines, replaces their crews with his own men, and then plans to launch nukes um, to start World War Three, completely destroy the surface world, and then cr- repopulate and create a new society under the sea. Now it seems to me that he could create a new society under the sea without having to kill the society out of the sea, but whatever. Uh, he needs he needs to motivate them into getting into the sea, and what better way than to fucking pollute the entire atmosphere in, into in a nuclear apocalypse? If he did that, he wouldn't be evil. Evil! Um, <laughs> evil! And so, yeah, that's his plan. He's going to murder everybody, and then, because he says that society is too, has become too. <laughs> We're living in a society! Living in a society, and according to Stromberg, it's become too, uh, what's the word he uses? Uh, decadent. So he wants to destroy them all and then um, start over. Yes. Under See what I mean by raising the stakes here? It's like with Goldfinger, he had a great plan in terms of, like, wanting to. Um, destroyed the world's gold supply so that his gold would be the only would have like more value than anything else on the planet so like he's kind of in a way kind of taking over the world economy by that point he's like trying to take over the world but like in a more subtle means whereas this guy is just blow the whole fucking world apart and then we'll start over under Under the the sea sea. (laughs) Uh, I'm God, I see. But the question is, like, who is he yeah. repopulating with? Is it just going to be him and uh, what's her name down there? Like, I presume that there are some people who he will invite. He'll, maybe I guess he might be inviting the survivors. I think the he, his idea is to like invite all of the um, invite all the survivors to live down in his sanctuary, underwater sanctuary. I don't know. See, this is one aspect of this exact same fucking plot that they did better in Moonraker. Uh-huh. Because in Moonraker, Drax's plan, because again, this movie and Star Wars were the two biggest movies of 1977. Yeah. And so in Moonraker, it's just this movie, but space. Um, because they really wanted to make more money. Uh, so Drax, the villain in that film, yeah, is a pretty good modern villain, to be honest. He wants to... Uh, he's He's got this space base, and his plan is to release poisonous gas into the Earth's atmosphere that will kill everybody. And then he's going to repopulate using this group of people that he has handpicked. And we actually see these people that he's handpicked. He's handpicked these like people who have like all the best genetics, and they're going to be the ones to repopulate the Earth. He's basically going to create like a master race. Um... But, like, you know, we see them. We see the people that he's selected. Whereas with Stromberg, it's like, yes, his plan is I'm going to destroy the surface world and we'll start over under the sea. But with who? I'm like, is it just going to be you and your employees down there, dude? Like, (laughs) it's going to be one big sausage party down there. Uh, Everybody's just going to, he's just going to have sex with all the women and have a bunch of web fingered babies and they'll (laughs) swim through the sea with their web hands and evolve into mermaids. Maybe that's his plan. I don't know. Uh, If only he had a a body that was more suitable for swimming. 
Mm, that's true. That's true. He's a bit like Goldfinger in that respect, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. He is a rotund fella. Oh, yeah, it's rotund. Good word, yeah. Uh, and uh... Corpulent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it? So, we, we're inside this giant uh, tanker, and the set is amazing. I'm not sure if... I, I doubt that much space could fit inside a tanker, but who cares? Uh, and also, well, at one point they say this is yeah. the biggest uh, tanker in the world, right? And um, at, at points you get you you see the interiors, like these like very sci-fi heavy, um, heavily designed uh, hallways, and it reminds me a lot of like the interiors of the Death Star. And it's really funny mm -hmm. that both films came out around the same time, so I gotta wonder if there was just like a popular design trend, like '70s sci-fi design trend, or if they had if there were ever any like. Um, people who kind of worked in similar circles that uh that were working on both movies at the time i would say that it's probably just more of a coincidence okay um but yeah i really did got uh, i really did get um uh, death star vibes from the inside of this uh, evil villain base uh ship uh, tanker ship and so by the time james bond helps the rest of the uh the captured uh, submarine crews to escape and there's just this like very prolonged action sequence where it's just this gigantic like prison escape like film like it's just war and chaos down there with tons of explosions bodies flying left and right and then like the the great the probably the best sequence in the movie for me was just when bond is trying to um take this bomb that he got out of a nuclear war nu nuclear warhead and was like uh, hanging on for dear life onto some sort of mechanical contraption that took him to the the impenetrable, virtually impenetrable wall separating him and the control room and the rest of the villains, and just blowing it up, the, blowing it the fuck up, while also trying to desperately try to m get out of there before the bomb explodes. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of tension in that scene. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of Bond movies also will have these sort of large battle sequences uh -huh. uh, Thunderbolt notably had an underwater battle sequence it was like a bunch of people in scuba gear shooting each other with harpoons I remember that then, yeah which we get, little, we, we get a little yeah, bit yeah, of we get a little underwater, bit of that underwater yeah but with like more explosions <laughs> yeah yeah and torpedoes uh, yeah. and then uh, in uh, uh, you only live twice you know the, the, you had Blofeld's big sort of hollowed out volcano lair and then a bunch of like ninjas came in and there was like a big battle sequence in there. Um, and it happens again at, at various points throughout the franchise. But the, the, there wasn't really one in Goldfinger, I, unless I guess you count the part at near the end where the army, you know, stopped pretending to be asleep and then started shooting up gold members then. So maybe that does count as like a battle sequence sort of, but uh, yeah, this, this is the first one that you've actually seen, I think, that's like, like a proper like James Bond-like battle sequence. Uh. Right, right. And uh, let's see. Oh, I, also, I remember the, the the part where they deactivate the nuclear warheads. Or no, not de deactivate, just getting the, the submarines um, pilot, uh, I guess you would say piloted for a submarine. Yeah, piloted by uh, the henchmen. The, uh, well, there's also the moment... Yeah, they do have to disarm because remember Roger Moore has to pull that thing out of the bomb, right? And he can't let it touch the sides because it's magnetic. Yes, and <laughs> if, he, if he touches the sides, they all go boom. It's the most dangerous game of operation anybody's ever played. Yes, and he he just barely manages to do it, and that's a that's a great scene oh, too. There's a yeah, there, there's a part where it's like, uh, have you done this before? It's like never too late to learn. <laughs> I just love the yeah. look on one of the guy's face. He's like, what the fuck? We're all gonna die. <laughs> He's like, it's his first time for everything, and then he just starts pulling the thing out. <laughs> but, uh, no, I was actually referring to the part where the uh, the two uh, nu uh, nuclear subs that were under the control of the henchmen, they tried to trick them into shooting, launching their nukes at each other, and that whole scene is, is shot in pure silence. And so I thought, you know, it made for a really intense moment in the, in the movie. And uh, that also reminded me how, for some reason... The majority of the one-on-one -on -one fist fights in this movie are all done with no music whatsoever. Yes. Is that a thing that's just common in Bond movies, or was it just this one? Um, I feel like that's more so just a thing that happens a lot in older movies in general. I can think of okay. a lot of movies where people are 
doing fisticuffs and there's just not much musical accompaniment because they want you to focus on the sounds of yeah, the struggle. I guess that's true because like thinking back to like say I don't know this it might sound very random but this is a movie inspired a lot by spy bond espionage films uh Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla where anytime you had like the uh the aliens uh, in human disguises trying to go after the King Caesar statue there's often it's often accompanied with a lack of music so it's just a lot of uh natural sound of just like people like T- like like getting into a tussle and throwing each other uh like throwing things at each other smacking each other and yeah. just yeah a lot of uh, uh a lot of dead silence there it's just a different approach to sound design that i think is isn't as common nowadays nowadays anytime there's a fist fight you, you gotta throw in some music over it it's like right yeah yeah, so that, that was just something I thought was rather peculiar. But uh, other than that, just like a lot of... Th- there's just nothing but... It, it's like one of those movies where you like you never feel bored. There's always something happening, always something on screen to capture the eyes. And uh, yeah, it's just... There's so much there. I forgot to even mention... Um, I, think, I, I was just going to say, I think yeah. the most recent example of it I can think of is in mm-hmm. Kill Bill Volume 1. Mm. When uh, Uma Thurman fights... Vivica A. Fox in that house. Right, yeah, there was no music there. There's there's no music in that scene, it's just the sounds of them throwing each other around the room and, like, grunting and, like, breaking shit. Like, it's it's a lot of sound design, but not a lot of, but no score in that sequence. Right, right. Um, But I did want to mention one cool moment where the moment was, like, the actual helicopter moment where Naomi, the uh, evil henchwoman, is chasing after uh, Anya and, uh, and Bond, and they're in their car, they dive into the water, and the fact that they had, like, a real helicopter, like, moving around, twisting and turning on, like, in front of the camera, I thought was really impressive. But the fact is, like, she dies, like, a really spectac- spectacular way, where they, where <laughs> Bond just has a missile launched from his submarine car into the helicopter. Yeah, that was great. I don't know if a, if a female henchman has ever gotten it that bad, aside from the woman who got eaten by a shark, but that was really cool. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Because, like, guys get it, like, male henchmen get it bad all the time, so I don't know how often, like, female henchmen often die brutal deaths in Bond films. There's, uh, it's one of the few times that Bond, like, actively, like, you see Bond, like, actively kill a woman, too, like... Uh-huh. He blows her the fuck up. <laughs> uh, more often, it'll be something like the scene earlier in the film where he's at that dude's house and one of the assassins tries to kill him and he's like making out with this chick and then he notices the guy's about to shoot him and he like spins her around and then the guy shoots and it goes into her back instead. Right. Uh, usually it's more like stuff like that as opposed to like him literally just shooting them with a fucking missile. <laughs> right. To be fair, again, she had a helicopter with guns attached. She did have a helicopter with guns attached. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, let's so see. The first James Bond once said, sometimes you have to strike a woman. All right, but you know you're... <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, the seven, the sixties and seventies were quite a different time, my friend. Uh, anyway, uh, yes. Uh, uh, any other things to mention in this film? Because uh, we are running about, uh, we're we're close to an hour at this point. What do you think about the score of the film? The sort of uh, there's this sort of theme through. The, there's this theme that's like this like de- 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 like it, that goes on like during a lot of the like establishing shots and things like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, which is which is quite lovely. Mm. Um, there's some very interesting music during the sort of Egypt scenes. Yes, very Egypt sounding music. <laughs> yeah, a lot of. Ah, <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> Uh, at one point yeah at one point as a joke when bond and agent triple x are stranded in the desert they play they're like walking across the desert and they play the uh, the lawrence of arabia music yes that was pretty amusing where it's like oh so the, even they did like silly you know wink and a nod references at this at this point yeah um there are some instrumental versions of the of the theme throughout the film, which yes, we, we never we haven't talked about that yet. It better. We haven't talked about that yet. Uh, nobody does it better by Carly Simon. This is one of the more 
famous and successful James Bond um, theme songs. It was it was a hit, yeah. and um, it started something of a tradition. Uh, a large portion of the Roger Moore films, mm -hmm. from this through Octopussy, just have these sort of um, love ballads as themes, mm -hmm. um, and it's a very different approach from the sort of like brassy. Um, you know, like Shirley Bassey, Goldfinger, or Tom Jones in Thunderball, like approach. Mm. Uh, which one was the was uh, View to a Kills? Uh, wh uh, which, which Bond? Who, who was the Bond in View to a Kill? Because that was View like... to a Kill is Roger Moore's last movie. Okay, and that that's more of a, that's that has a theme by uh, Duran Duran. Uh -huh. Or no, Duran Duran. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we dance oh. into the fire. Yeah, I was thinking of the, uh, the next movie after that, Living Daylights. That one is Aha. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, Duran Duran uh -huh. does Aha. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Duran Duran <laughs> Duran Duran does A View to a Kill. Um, and how would yeah, you describe the, how would you describe that theme? Because that's a kick-ass theme right there. That belongs to a different tradition of James Bond f f themes, which is uh, more of like a rock and roll type sort of theme, which uh, I would argue started with um, "Live and Let Die," and then right. was sort of and then was sort of revived later on. Uh, "Man with the Golden Gun" has a song by uh, Lulu, which is more of a return to like the Shirley Bassey era of like belting a song that describes the villain. <laughs> uh, okay. Goldfinger, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Um, as for Nobody Does It Better, yeah, this is definitely a different flavor of music compared to Goldfinger. Uh, I, yeah. the, the funny it's thing very, is... Ch it's, it's a very yeah. chill song. It's very yes. sort of easy listening. It's the sort of thing that comes on, you know, uh, when you're, like, riding down the road. And yeah. Like, oh, it, nice. it, <laughs> it, it plays yeah. better in the back when you play it in the background while you're doing something or watching something as opposed to experiencing it like uh, isolated from everything in an isolated environment or situation yeah. um, it complements the visuals of yes. the opening title sequence quite well very um, much so yeah yeah very very beautiful b very uh, beautifully done for that uh, intro sequence as well um i'd say that it goes for a lot of the music uh, um it extends to the music my thoughts for the theme extends to the music as well where it's like it's not something that i could i can imagine myself listening to on its own but it does its job well at enhancing um the visuals on screen all right all right and then uh, one more thing we can talk about uh, mm -hmm. we sort of uh have hinted at it here and there we sort of danced around it but uh mm -hmm. Let's talk about that fantastic ski chase scene at, yes. the, at the beginning of the <laughs> film or near the beginning of the film. That's that's a great sequence. Super, um, yeah. Really nice balance. I know, like, um, most likely there's uh, some obvious green screen work, but it's like I'm, I'm glad that they kept it to a minimum and showed, like, actual people actually skiing down actual mountains. Yes, and it ends with one of the best stunts in the franchise. Yes. The guy skis off the side of the cliff ditches his skis in midair and then opens that parachute and of course it's a british flag parachute and the james bond theme comes ba -da, ba -da. <laughs> um, and you were hyping this up like moments before it happened i'm like oh shit is he gonna is he gonna do it oh he did it oh the music's in oh it's all perfect <laughs> and then cut from that to the the piano for nobody does it better because then we go into the the uh the theme song yes which by the um, way i forgot to mention that i do have some fondness for nobody does it better solely because of our buddy bill because at, at certain points back during the, our the days of the sons of sarah's all podcast he would just burst into songs singing that for no reason whatsoever so when i heard that song here i was like oh that's where it's from like i knew it was a bond movie but i didn't know which bond movie it was yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't share the title of the film. You know? No. <laughs> there is one moment in the song that, <laughs> where she says, the spy who loved me. And it doesn't really make sense in the context of the song. It's funny. Sometimes in these James Bond opening songs, they feel the need to force the title in there, even if it doesn't really work. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's part of the charm, I suppose. So the, for the title of the spy who loved me, is the spy supposed to be triple X or Bond? Good question. Or is it the spy that he killed at the beginning of the oh. film? Oh, interesting questions. Oh. Who's the spy? Who's doing the loving here? Who's being loved? <laughs> who shagged who? <laughs> um, 
I think it's a spy who shagged me joke in here somewhere. Uh, there, there you go. It's yeah, been, there you it's go. Been done. Yeah. Uh, who, who, it's obligatory. Who, who did the loving and who did the shagging? Is that well? We all know who did the shagging. <laughs> <laughs> Not that part, Andres. And uh, somebody has to keep the British. <laughs> the British <end. laughs> uh, uh, I forgot which song. Which is the song that? Go, which is the Bond movie that has "We're at an all time high"? That's Octopussy. Okay, that octopusy. Yes. <laughs> that's another one I know solely because of Bill. A, a James Bond movie that I used to not like, but recently I've really come around on Octopussy. It's become one of one of the good ones in my opinion. Hmm. All right then. Uh, yes. But yeah, overall, great sequence, which led to a great song, a great uh, Bond song, which led to a, which is, was part of a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, score for an all, also equally wonderful movie. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think we can sum up any better than that. So we are yes. both fully endorsing the spy who loved me. Yes, always. All right, well, you heard it here first, folks. If you haven't seen this movie, uh, what are you doing? Why did you listen to us spoil the entire <laughs> thing? Go, go watch it for yourself. Uh, where can, where you... do you think they can watch it, uh, Dylan? Good question. Where can one stream The Spy Who Loved Me? I'm going to find out right now. I mean, didn't we watch it on HBO Plus or something? HBO Max? No, we, we watched it through a uh, less reputable method, Andres. Ah, that, uh, I, I see. will not go into here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So it can be watched on iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, or YouTube. Uh, there you go. Or of course, if you're a fan of those uh, are all the, rental. Those yes. are all rental platforms, by the way. There's right. there's no options for streaming it for free unless you go through with uh, more right. disreputable uh, uh, means. Would I? Now that I've seen like two Bond films, does that make me a casual Bond fan at this point, or do I still need to see like one or two more films to call call myself that? I think you're a casual Bond fan. You've seen two Bond films. You like them. Yes. You're you're very receptive to the franchise. You're eager to learn more. Yes. I think that, I, I think that you've seen a documentary all about George Lazenby. Yes, you I You know have. more about George Lazenby's life than many other Bond fans probably do. <laughs> I know more than Bill, and he hasn't seen these, seen because he hasn't seen it either. Last time we checked. Right. Exactly. So uh, yeah, you, yeah, I think you definitely qualify as a Yay! casual Bond fan. Yay! I can call myself a Bond fan now. Welcome to the Bond fandom, and then people will be like, "What's your favorite Bond film?" And you, you, you have two to pick from, and you'll be like, uh. <laughs> uh, uh, "Have a good day." Or you have a good day. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, yes. That uh, that concludes our review of the Spy Who Loved Me. Now, Andreas, do you want to uh, tell the people about next episode? Yes. Episode so, forty. As you know, we are going to reach another five episode milestone. And so, you know what that means. It is time for another guest spot appearance. This time around, we're going to invite my good friend, Laura Fitkin of the Review Roulette podcast, a podcast that I've appeared on several times, mostly revolving around pulp action movies such as The Shadow, The Phantom, and The Rocketeer. So you can check those out uh, wherever podcasts uh, can be viewed, especially here on YouTube as well. So for Laura's appearance, we're going to take a look at a 1998 anime uh, called Bubblegum Crisis Tokyo 2040, a retelling of the 1987 OVA series Bubblegum Crisis. So from what she's told me, it is pretty much the same story, just updated 10 years later. In this case, they actually completed the story, whereas the original 80s OVA was apparently an incomplete story. So yeah, we're going to check out some uh, good old 90s anime featuring a bunch of women in cyberpunk power armor fighting off a bunch of bad guys. And I cannot wait. I've never watched the All original. Right. Nev- uh, Meep shit, let's go. <laughs> yes, we're going back to the world of anime. And so yeah, look forward to that if you like. And so until next time, uh, where can people find you, Dylan? 
up here <laughs> pretty much all right then and of course you probably know by now but if you haven't i happen to have an indie comic primal warrior drake lazul available on amazon kindle and comiXology as well as a book primal warrior drake lazul full metal chronicles and an upcoming drake lazul novel so for any and all future updates on drake lazul my giant robot giant monster passion project you can follow me on twitter at pw underscore drake lazul on Instagram at Kaiju Noir and on Facebook through the Primal Warrior Draco Azul page. So that's right. Everybody go watch <laughs> Tiger King. <laughs> uh, yes, like we're gonna do right now. So until next time, everybody, I have been Andres Perez, aka Kaiju Noir. And I have been Super DM64. And until next time, everybody, take care.